Hey everybody, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be talking about the membrane potential. Once again, I would like to thank Michigan State University for the lovely book and Casey Henley for the wonderful illustrations. Now, if we remember what a membrane potential is, the neuron's membrane potential is a difference in electrical charge between its interior and the surrounding extracellular fluid. And typically, this is around minus 65 millivolts at rest, meaning the inside is more negative than the outside. And uh, it's measured by placing a reference electrode in the extracellular solution or outside the neuron and a recording electrode inserted into the neuron's cell body or the soma. And the voltage difference between these two electrodes is the neuron's membrane potential. Now let's clarify some terminology. Depolarization occurs when the membrane potential moves towards zero millivolts, reducing the difference between inside and outside. This is often described as a decrease in membrane potential because the interior becomes less negative. For example, going from minus 65 millivolts to minus 50 millivolts. And hyperpolarization occurs when the membrane potential moves away from zero millivolts, increasing the difference between inside and outside. And it's often described as an increase in membrane potential because the interior becomes more negative. For example, going from minus 65 millivolts to minus 75 millivolts, like you can see on the graph above. Now, inside the neuron, the net charge is typically more negative than the outside. And this happens because ions are not distributed equally. Sodium chloride and calcium ions tend to be concentrated in the extracellular fluid. Potassium and various large anions like proteins and amino acids are more concentrated inside the cell. And because these charged particles are unequally distributed, the interior ends up negatively charged relative to the exterior when the neuron is at rest. And if you guys remember, that is around minus 65 millivolts. Now, what drives the ion movement? The unequal ion distribution creates electrochemical gradients, which have two components, if you guys remember from the previous video. The concentration gradient being the ions flowing from regions of high concentration to regions of low concentration and the electrical gradient meaning ions are attracted to regions of opposite charge and repelled by regions of similar charge for example at rest potassium is driven out by its higher internal concentration although the negative inside can pull some potassium back in. And sodium is driven in both by its concentration gradient, being high on the outside, and by the negative internal charge. If the membrane becomes permeable to an ion uh, via open channels, for example, that ion will move according to its electrochemical gradient. Now, if you all remember, the ion's equilibrium potential is the membrane voltage at which the ion's electrical gradient and concentration gradient exactly balance each other. At that specific voltage, there is no net movement of the ion. Let's take a look at the driving forces on sodium, for example. At rest, minus 65 millivolts, Sodium is heavily pulled into the neuron because its concentration is about 10 times higher outside than inside, or the concentration gradient goes inward, and the interior is negatively charged, so the electrical gradient is also inward. As sodium enters and the inside becomes more positive, the electrical gradient weakens. Eventually, if the membrane potential becomes positive enough, the electrical push outward 
cancels the inward pull from the concentration gradient. And for many neurons, sodium's equilibrium potential is about plus 60 millivolts. Once the membrane approaches plus 60 millivolts, sodium has no net movement. Now for those math nerds, the Nernst equation provides a way to compute the equilibrium potential for a given ion, knowing its internal and external concentrations. Now in our example, 61 is the constant in millivolts related to physiological temperature, Z is the ion's charge, and ion outside and ion inside are of course the ion's external and internal concentrations. So you can take a look at the example for sodium up on the screen. Now, if a neuron's membrane potential differs from an ion's equilibrium potential, that ion will move through open channels uh, to push the membrane potential closer to its own equilibrium potential. For example, if a cell is at minus 70 millivolts and uh, sodium's equilibrium potential is plus 60 millivolts, the sodium will flow inward to drive the membrane potential upward. And in the second example you can see below, if uh, chlorium has an equilibrium potential of minus 65 millivolts and the neuron is at minus 70 millivolts, the chlorium will exit, removing negative charge and nudging the cell potential towards minus 65 millivolts. Now overall, uh, the membrane potential is shaped by the unequal distribution of ions, sodium, potassium, chlorium, and calcium, and by the selective permeability of the neuronal membrane. Depolarizations and hyperpolarizations occur when ion channels open or close, altering which ions cross the membrane and in which directions. Equilibrium potentials for each ion define the voltage at which no net movement occurs. And the Nernst equation allows us to calculate these values very precisely. Um, and if we compare the cell's actual membrane potential to each ion's equilibrium potential, we can predict the flow of ions. And of course, understand the electrical signals at the heart of neural communication.